Praise God and welcome to Nightline. I am your host, Nathan Bland. It's so good to have you guys with us tonight. Uh, I tell you, we've got a really good show lined up for you tonight, and I'm, uh, I'm excited to talk to our guests tonight. Uh, we have Minister Wayne Rice Sr. Uh, he's the author of Why Am I So Happy? And you're going to find out tonight why he is happy. Uh, and uh, he's got a lot of uh, a good reason to celebrate. Uh, we also have Dr. Gabriel O'Sullivan. Uh, he's the author of Thy Will Be Done. And we have Rev uh, Reverend Edward L. Surratt and, uh, from Edward L. Enterprises. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to tonight's show. Not only are we going to have a chance to talk to each individual guest about their testimonies and what God is doing through their life, but we're also going to be focusing a little bit on about some of the things that men today may be facing. So uh, I think it's going to be a really good show. And uh, if you're a woman right now, don't turn the channel. This, you need to hear this too. You know, some of the best books that I have ever read uh, have, has been something that, uh, for instance, my wife may have mentioned that I need to do or that I need to kind of pay attention to. And so it's important for me as a husband to be a good husband that I look at those things, look at those books, take in material that help me to be a better husband. So if you've ever sat there and looked at your husband and said, I wonder what he's thinking. Well, this might be a good show for you to kind of stay tuned into and uh, hope, hopefully God will minister to you as well, and I believe he will. Our scripture tonight comes from Psalm chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. And it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You know, I've been teaching a lot about meditating on God's Word. You know, sometimes I think that we get in the habit of, of reading things uh, <clears throat> and not really processing what it says. You know, in order to really, have you ever read in the Bible and you read through a whole chapter and then you sit there and think, I, I don't even know what I just read, but I know I read it. And then you just check off the box and say, I, I, I did what I was supposed to do today. I, I read the scriptures. Well, until you focus your conscious mind on what you're reading, it will never sink into your subconscious, which the Bible actually in the Hebrew, the heart, when it talks about the heart, it's referring to the subconscious mind. And it says, out of the heart come the issues of life. So focusing our conscious mind on what it is that God is saying through his word so it can get into our subconscious and become a part of who, who we are is so important. And one of the ways you can do that is by meditating on the law, meditating on his word and allow God to bring things out to you that you never would have thought of. So... Um, <clears throat> we do want to mention tonight that uh, if you have prayer requests, which we've already got some that have came in, uh, we want to invite you to call into our prayer line at 864-244-1616. Let uh, the person on the phone, let them know your prayer request. They will pray with you, and then we'll get that prayer request here on the table so that we can pray for that need as well tonight. Right now, we're going to be going to Kenny Smith, and he is going to be singing, I Am a Friend of God. Praise the Lord, everybody. Hallelujah. 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 God is so wonderful. Hallelujah. He is so greatly to be praised. When I think about everything that he has done, I can truly say that God is a friend. Anybody just glad that he is your friend? Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Who am I that you are mindful of me? That you
Praise God. And that's Kenny Smith. I tell you what, that's, uh, we're going to have some really good music tonight. Uh, Kenny, that was so anointed. <clears throat> um, before we go to our guests, I do want to mention that we are in the process of updating our military prayer list right now. Um, uh, we basically maintain a, a prayer list for service members uh, in the armed forces of the US, United States. So if you have a friend or a family member that you wish for us to remember in prayer on our Nightline program, we would ask that you let us, uh, let us know by either calling the number that you see on the screen there or by going to WGGS16.com and uh, complete the military request form. I, I was told that that request form is down at the bottom of the page. So once you go there, you can scroll to the bottom to fill that in. Uh, we also have the WGGS TV 16 prayer vigil that will be held uh, Saturday, May 5th. That's this Saturday. Um, that'll be here at the station from 10.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. Uh, and that's hosted by Pastor Bill and Nell Montgomery. If you have uh, questions or need to get some information about that, you can call 864-244-1616. Uh, they're going to be coming together this Saturday to pray for our families, the community, and the nation. And the Lord knows that we need it. <clears throat> right now, we're going to be going to our guest tonight. We've got uh, Minister Wayne Rice, uh, Sr., Dr. Gabriel O'Sullivan, and Reverend Edward L. Surratt. Guys, it's so good to have you on the show tonight. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having you. So uh, <clears throat> I want to I want to talk first with uh, uh, Minister Rice. Um, you have overcome a battle that you were facing. Um, can you just kind of tell us what it was that you've came through and kind of give us your testimony of what's, yes. what God's done for you? Yes, uh, back in 2007, uh, just through routine blood work on my, my job, and it was determined that I was uh, had multiple myeloma, which is one of the three blood cancers. I'm sure you've, you've heard of uh, lymphoma, leukemia. Multiple myeloma is the third blood cancer. And it's really a, a cancer where the bad cells starts accumulating your bone marrow and it starts crowding out the, the good cells. And of course, when that happens, it wreaks havoc on the body. Mm. So um, it was a storm that was, of course, unexpected, as storms usually are. And uh, it's been a about an 11 year battle, but it's a battle that, that I'm winning because uh, God said I would win it, and uh, it's a battle that's it's, it's, it's ongoing, but I know that it's, uh, the victory is, is, is already mine, and I know that I will die one day, but it will not be for my Loma. Praise God. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that came as a shock to you when you're just getting normal blood work. You know, a lot of times we, <clears throat> we just think that something's a, a routine checkup, and uh, yes. people, you know, are basically told about news that they weren't yeah. even expecting. It, and, and it was, it was a shock when I uh, got the phone call at work. Uh, my doctor's uh, nurse called and usually they call and give me the results and I say, okay, well, I'll see you in six months. This time she called and said, well, Dr. Ball would like to speak with you. And that's when the wheels started turning. It's like she's never asked to speak to me herself. So she gave me the news that she had her suspicions and then, of course, I had to go up to uh, the Gibbs Cancer Center in Spartanburg and have a uh, bone marrow biopsy, which is a whole lot of fun if you've ever mm. had the pleasure of having one. But uh, the, after that, it was determined that, uh, I was, that, uh, that I did have multiple myeloma. So I went out to Little Rock, Little Rock Arkansas for 14 days, me and my wife, and extens extensive test, and uh, came back and didn't have to do anything for a couple of years. And then I started having symptoms, and it was time for uh, chemotherapy, and I did chemotherapy for a couple of years. And uh, it's, that was just up and down. Uh, you, you hear about chemotherapy, but until you feel that stuff going through your veins, it's, it's another story. Now, you're the author of Why Am I So Happy? Yes. So does that story come out of it this does. battle? So uh, tell us why you are so happy. Well, First of all, and some people, when I, when I tell them this, I, I think they don't believe me, but if I could change this entire diagnosis, I wouldn't because I feel that this is uh, an avenue to, to be able to speak to, to others 
and to give others uh, hope in a certain way. And I'm happy because I know that God has his hands, his hand on my life. And I'm happy because he, for him to think enough of me that I would be strong enough to handle this thing mm. that he has uh, allowed to, to happen. And uh, I'm happy because I know that if I live, I'm in a good place because I'm with my family, I'm with my loved ones. But then if I die, I'm, I'm in heaven, so I can't lose either way. Right. Now, was there anything about your, your, your view on your life, your perspective on life, uh, after you have had this news? Yes. <clears throat> the view and the perspective on life is that I realized that I wasn't here for myself. We're, we're all here, just as Jesus came to die for all of us, we're here for others. We're here to, to give others hope, to, to, to give inspiration to others. And uh, that's what I try to do daily. My prayer at night is that I can touch at least one person each day, even if it's just a smile, even if it's just a conversation, even if it's just my, my story, to, to give them hope. And uh, once we realize that we're not here selfishly for, for ourselves, our lives will be a, a lot better. It's, it's, I would rather uh, talk to someone daily and see them happy, give them hope than anything else in life. So what is the state of this sickness now? Well, I, I love put, put it, putting it this way. The doctors say that it's something that's still there. And uh, I go back about every six to eight weeks for, for routine blood work. <clears throat> and uh, my numbers, they will, this number will go up, then this number will go down. And it's like a, like a stock, stock market chart. But uh, it's still there, but I'm not doing chemotherapy right now. And uh, I really don't think I will ever have to go back on it. I just believe that. And uh, it's, it's, it's just something that's just there. Honestly, I believe if, if they would have tested me for this 30 years ago, that something still would have showed. That's just my makeup, and that's just the way that I'm, that, that I'm made. And I'm, I'm believing that this is just something that uh, I can use as a stepping stone to, to give my testimony and to talk to others about no matter what kind of storm comes through your life, uh, if you just trust God that he can that he'll see you through it. Before this happened, did you have any other, uh, any other health issues at all that you were aware of? None. I, uh, <clears throat> I ran about every day. I, I loved doing uh, marathons, half marathons, uh, played tennis, uh, so I had no health issues, issues. That's why this came as a, as a huge shock. Uh, no, no issues at all, other than just the normal joint things from, mm -hmm. you know, just from being active. <clears throat> you know, do you think that at that time before you found this news out, that, uh, did you have like a lot of us do have that mentality that I'm invincible? <laughs> <laughs> or nothing's going to happen to me, you know. I'm, you know, cause it's easy for us to do that. Well, not not really. I, honestly, I sort of, not that I'm a pessimist, pessimistic person, but I sort of expect that something. Uh, <clears throat> cancer, I, didn't, I can't honestly say I, I expected that, but I did expect something to to, to happen because, uh, not not that, I think I needed something to push me into what God had had for me to do. And maybe this was the maybe this was the avenue. Maybe I was hard headed in the past. And maybe this was was this was the thing that I needed to push me towards what God has for me to do. So who had the most influence on your life? My father. He was he was a quiet uh, type person, but whenever he spoke, people listened. Uh, because he didn't, he didn't have much to say, but whenever he said it, he spoke it in it, it was with authority. And uh, just the, the type of person that he was, he, he, he loved everyone. I, I remember growing up and we would uh, drive down the road and there was this guy that he would pick up every time going back home. And this guy, he, he liked to drink. And during the summertime, I could smell the alcohol on him. And, and, he, and he never, ever told me why he would pick this guy up and take him home. And as I grew up later on in life, I, I, I realized he was showing me that there but by the grace of God go me because uh, he showed me what true love is, that I'm no better than anybody else no matter what they're doing. 
And I, and I will always remember that thing he taught me without ever saying one word to me. You know, I think it's, uh, it's such an important thing in uh, young men's life and starting at a young age that they have uh, mentors. And sometimes, sometimes people have fathers. We hope, we would like for it to always be that way, but sometimes it's not. It wasn't in my case. Uh, I had an uncle that was a... Uh, a big influence on my life and a mentor to me. <clears throat> and I think for me, I, f I found that when you don't have like that father figure, that role model in your life growing up, you end up, you know, looking for other role models. And, you know, I think it's such a, a great movement where we see uh, churches and groups coming together to assign mentors to people so that they can help counsel them and guide them and lead them and, you know, give them some of the... Uh, the teaching that they may need to, you know, kind of identify who they are. So, uh, you know, uh, Reverend Surratt and uh, Dr. Gabriel, what are, who are some mentors or people in your life that you feel were pivotal in you being able to know who you are or had a big impact on your life as a young man that you think that you can still see it in your life today? <laughs> you are so gracious. Yeah, I'd like to go first. Um, Wow, there, I mean, there's been so many, you know, my father, uncles, uh, you know, I don't have, you know, any biological brothers, but I had cousins who, you know, who grew up, they were like my brothers. And so I had one older, older cousin, and he's, he was probably the most influential because I, I tell everybody, he's the one who kept me off drugs. I never drank and never did drugs. And he was, you know, I looked up to him because he was like 6'4". And so growing up, he was always like the big brother. And I remember one day we was riding down the road and, you know, we had, you know, like a lot of communities, you have your community drunk, so to speak. And our community drunk was passed out in the, in the front yard. And it was a Saturday morning, and I never forget this. I never forget this. And we was riding by, and he said, if I ever see you drinking or doing drugs like that, I'm going to kick your tail. I mean, you know, just blunt. Mm -hmm. And that scared me. And I'm like, wow, I'm never doing drugs. I'm never drinking. And, you know, 51 years old, never did drugs, never, you know. And so I, I, I credit him. <clears throat> with that, but even like uh, Wayne says, <clears throat> my dad has been an influence as well. Cause my dad doesn't say anything, you know, but when he speaks, everybody stops and listen. Mm -hmm. You know, my dad can just sit in the living room, watch TV while everything is going on around, but if he goes to say something, it's like everybody would just quiet down, like, okay, what did he say? And mm -hmm. so I've learned a lot from him. Then, you know, my uncles, just, you know, having, uh, you know, having those men, mm -hmm. having those men, those real men, around growing up, having those real men showing me, teaching me uh, what it's like, what, what a man's supposed to do. You know, my parents been married 54, 53, 54, it'll be 54 years in June. So my parents are an example, even though things may have gotten tough early in the marriage, in the marriage or whatever, we stuck together. So my parents taught me that, you know, how, how important marriage was. But having those uncles, that really just you know took you by took you by the hand and said don't do this, don't go there, don't do this, don't go there, don't do this, you know, and those things really just stuck with me all of my life because even when I find myself going left, and you know, and even you hear the voice of God, God said you're not supposed to do that, and I'm like okay God, but I got this, mm -hmm. but there's an uncle that comes up behind God and said boy don't do that, right. and, you know, I'm like let me get back to the right side, so uh, you know just a lot of men growing up just really influential. Uh, you know, I have, a, I guess one of the most, uh, I have an Uncle Clyde who passed back in 2006. And he told me when I first went into ministry, he said, just be yourself. He said, be yourself. He said, you can't please everybody. I'm going like, but I'm a minister now. He said, no, be yourself. And I've, to this day, I've always just, uh, since 2002, 2001, going into the ministry, I never forgot that. Just keep it real. Be myself. And it took me a while to understand what he meant. But as I grow more into the ministry, as I grow more uh, mature, because it's a growing process daily, I, I remember those words, him saying, just be yourself. And so, uh, you know, to this day, those men are just really helped shape me, who helped shape who I am. And as I got into business, there have been others that have helped shape. <clears throat> you know, uh, Dr. O'Sullivan, when we come back, we're going to get into your testimony. It's a very powerful testimony. Uh, but we're going to start start it off. I'm going to give you a few more minutes to think about uh, who was that mentor, that person in your life. But I do want to make a, a, a just a quick note. Um, you know, I th 
you know, something you said about that, that drunk, that community drunk, you know, so most people would have seen that and they said, oh, that's a shame. You know, it is. But, you know, sometimes something just as small as taking something that they see and using it in, as a teaching moment. And, it, you know, he, he may have not have thought, how, how is this going to have an impact? But here you are today saying, I never will forget, right. you know. And so, you know, I, I just encourage you at home, if you feel like there is anybody that is in your family that looks up to you. I tell you, we need role models. We need good role models. Mm -hmm. And when we come back, I'm going to talk a little bit about role models because yeah. I feel like the Lord's leading me on that just uh, a little bit. But right now, we're getting ready to go to some awesome Kenny Smith music, <laughs> and he's going to be singing all around me. The greatest thing about God is that no matter what you find yourself in, no matter where you go, God is all around you. I'm a living witness. Thank you, Father, for being right there for me. Thank you, Father. Where can I go that your presence is not there? And what can I say that would take your spirit away from me? I can't imagine out
Praise God, and that's Kenny Smith. Uh, he's going to be with us throughout the night um, for this program. I tell you, he's really anointed. I, I do want to mention that we just had a salvation report come in. I love when I see these blue pieces of paper. Uh, individual named Carl Ray. Carl, we just uh, welcome you into the kingdom of God. I tell you, the Bible says that the angels in heaven are shouting right now. And I tell you, we're rejoicing with you. <clears throat> it, uh, it's such a blessing to know someone's coming into the kingdom of God. Uh, we're happy for you. Uh, this individual called in and they said uh, they want prayer for their husband. He is 10 years post colon cancer, but he has been having some bleeding since November. Uh, they just had a, another colonoscopy and they said there was no polyps, every, which was wonderful news. The, they had no suggestions what to do about the bleeding, so they just, they're wanting prayer that, you know, God will touch him and heal him the rest of the way. So I just want you to remember that. And we have many other prayer requests, but I uh, only have a little bit of time. So we're going to be praying over all these at the end of the hour. Uh, but I do want to mention this one. This person called in and said uh, they're having issues with uh, smoking and they're turning it over to God. You know, uh, I think that if the enemy can't keep you from coming to God and you, you come to God and you get saved and you still have a, a problem with smoking, the thing the devil's going to do next, because listen, we're, we don't just get saved to go to heaven. I believe that we get saved so that God can now use us in the earth. And if you've got an addiction to something, I tell you, the devil's just trying to al allow your purpose to be shortened and make it minimal. So you need to, to give it up and allow God to use you for as long as possible. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Um, so we're uh, uh, talking with uh, Reverend Surratt and uh, Minister Rice and Dr. O'Sullivan. Uh, and I, I want to come back to uh, Dr. Uh, O'Sullivan because we were, last thing we had mentioned, we were talking about role models. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that we have a, a, a need for, for good role models today. You know, whenever we watch sports, and we probably have, if I say sports, we have certain <laughs> figures that probably come into our mind, you know. And it's, I believe that what causes us to want to buy their shoes or buy their jersey uh, or buy some memorabilia, it's, it's really, what, I believe what we're really attracted to is the level of discipline that they have. I feel like that when we're attracted to different speakers. We're attracted to the level of discipline they have because the knowledge that they have is based on how much time they've spent in a certain field and studying something and we can learn something from it. Well, I, just because I buy Air Jordans, I'm not going to be able to jump as high as him. But people buy those shoes because of the level of discipline that he had in that realm. And what, what bothers me is a lot of times today, Role models don't seem to have, I, I know they had integrity problems years ago, but it seems like it's out there so much more now. You know, anything that they've done wrong, it's out there. And a lot of times, rather than them being remorseful about it, they try to hide it, they try to cover it up. And, or either if it comes out, they say, look, this is, this is just me. And I feel like that today with so many men looking up to some of these role models, if these role models are not good role models and they're proud of this behavior that they're having, what are, what are these young men thinking? You know, what are they going to think? They're thinking, hey, this, this must be acceptable and this is who I look up to. So, you know, I think fi having good role models is, is so important. Wouldn't you guys agree? Most definitely. Yes. So, uh, Dr. S uh, O'Sullivan, tell us about someone that was a good role model in your life or a mentor. Yeah, man, I was blessed. I had many. I mean, I, I, I say that I'm the, the, uh, the product of a broken home, but it, it worked out okay for me. My, my parents got divorced when I, before I can remember. They got remarried, and they've, they've been married to the same uh, person since. And so I really grew up with, with two families that I got to learn a lot from. 
Uh, so grew up with two dads and, and uncles, and and uh, so so certainly they poured into my life. And then as, as I got older, you, you mentioned sports. You know, coaches. You know, giving even PE teachers. You know, teaching you the value of self-discipline and and uh, and, and teachers in school. Uh, I, I think of one example about personal responsibility I learned from my sixth grade math teacher. Uh, this kid, this friend of mine, but he was just aggravating the fool out of me, sitting behind me flipping me in the back of the ear or something. I can't remember. I sure I, remember that. Oh, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I wanted just to, you know, knock him out. And uh, I, instead, I appealed to the teacher. And I said, hey, could you do something about him back here? He's really aggravating me. And she said, I'm not going to do anything about him. She said, you need to get up and move yourself. Take responsibility for yourself and don't worry about somebody else taking responsibility for the guy behind you. And, uh, man, I've never forgot that lesson from from Miss Wood. And so certainly could, could list countless lessons I've learned from my, from my parents and dads and uncles and uh, teachers and coaches through the years. But uh, in regards to personal responsibility, that's one that really stands out. You know, you've said two key, uh, key things that stand out to me. Uh, you said personal responsibility and you said self-discipline, which I think mm -hmm. is such an important discipline because I, I believe that in order to be a true leader, you have to have self-discipline mm -hmm. uh, because at some point you're going to be by yourself at some point there there's not always someone there to tell you what's right and what's wrong mm -hmm. and in order to be that leader of integrity you have to have some conviction to put that discipline on yourself mm -hmm. uh, and that's that is a that's a hard thing uh, to instill in. it can be a hard thing to instill in men today mm -hmm. uh, what uh, what do you think helped you guys in in your businesses or in your own realm? Uh, uh, Reverend Surratt, you're a motivational, inspirational speaker. Uh, what do you think was, whether it was a moment or what happened in your life that allowed that switch to flip so that you had something that you were wanting to be disciplined about and impose that self-discipline on yourself? Wow. <laughs> I guess one of the things that I often tell people what really guided me to being a motivational speaker was as a pastor, we were out evangelizing one, you know, one, one Saturday or something and uh, talking to young men and had a young man who said, you know, Reverend Surratt, I understand about being saved. I've given my life to Christ. I understand about all that. Teach me how to survive. And I'm going, you know, mm. what? Teach me how to survive. He said, because, you know, I've given my life. I'm not ready to die now. And I'm, he said, look around. This is, this is my life. This is what I live in. And you got drugs over here. You got everything going on. Teach me how to survive. And I'm going like, wow. So I had to take, I had to really look inward. And I'm like, okay, I can't go to him with the Bible, hmm. which we know Bible is great. But I had to just be real with him. Now let's teach him how to survive. Let's teach him how to be a young man. And so that right there just opened my eyes up to say, I got to do more than just being able to quote scripture, being able to save souls. There has to be a, a connect there that says, hey, I understand what you're doing, mm -hmm. but yet I want to be the one who comes up out of this so I can reach back and help more young men, help more young women. So that right there was my turning point in saying, okay, I want to be able to shape the lives of people. And I know going in schools, you, know, you can't mention God, you can't mention Jesus, all this. I said, but there has to be a way. So that was a turning point for me to be able to say, you know, I can motivate, I can inspire without using God, but I know God is using me. Mm -hmm. Without saying God, but I know God is speaking through me to help motivate, to help inspire, to help shape, <coughs> excuse me, to help shape someone's life. So that was my turning point. That young man, seeing him, he said, teach me how to survive. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud to say that that young man uh, is a lawyer today. Hmm. He graduated uh, I mean, he, for all his life, he, he was told, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't going, he wasn't going to amount to anything. But by switching my mindset and said, I'm going to help this young man because he's going to be able to give back. I'm going to help more than him. He was able to go to college. Never thought he would go to college. Mm. Never thought he would go to college. Went to college and he started being on the dean's list. Like, wait a minute, I can do this. And I'm like, you can do it, man. You can do it. And so he went from the dean's list, uh, got into law school. Now he's a lawyer in up in D.C. I, if I'm not mistaken, last time I talked to him. But it was just that, that change of mindset for me to see this young man being in the situation that he was in. He said, help me. Help me you know, help me get out of this. Teach me how to survive. What can I do to get out of this situation? I can go work over here, but I'm coming back here. 
this is my environment. I can go work down the street, but these are the friends I'm, I'm hanging with, so I need to be able to change all of this. You know, a few weeks ago, I was on here, and uh, I said this story then, but I think it's uh, relevant now. You know, one of my favorite speakers, uh, Dr. Miles Monroe, uh, uh, had the biggest impact anybody's ever had on my life back in 2003 and all the way up until his death in 2014. Uh, but, you know, he was asked to speak over in, I think it was Saudi Arabia. It was one of the Middle East countries that they didn't want to hear about Jesus. They wanted him to come and speak on business, and they said, no matter what you do, you can't talk about Jesus. Mm. Now, he's a Christian oh. preacher, and you're telling him you can't mention Jesus. So he said, what am I going to talk about? And so instead, he talked about the kingdom. Now, you can't talk about the kingdom without talking about the influence of the king. Mm -hmm. And so what he did is he said he never mentioned anything about Jesus at all. He talked about the principles of the kingdom. Now, in his books and in all of his teachings that he brought with him was about introducing them to Jesus and about introducing them to the king and the cross and the blood and making the way for them. So he put seeds in them that caused them to want to know. And they bought all the books, <laughs> and they bought all of his CDs. They bought everything he had. And he said that two weeks later, he got his first email because in the back of the book was the prayer leading them to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. He said, and he got a, a, an email from one of them and says, I read the book. I said the, pr I said the prayer. I'm saved. He said, after that, it just started trickling in. I read the book. I prayed the prayer. I read the book. I prayed the <laughs> prayer. So, you know, wow. I think that's so powerful what you said because sometimes we feel like, I, we don't use wisdom, I think. I think we try to beat something into them because we've been taught, can I use this liberally, in a religious way, that I've got to say these certain things. Mm -hmm. And God, sometimes you look at the Bible, how many times Jesus did something, he didn't go up to him all the time and just immediately tell him who he was and what he was doing. He just asked him, what do you need? And guess what? After he healed them, after he impacted them, after he influenced them, they would accept anything that he exactly. had for them because mm -hmm. he impacted their life. And that's what I feel like you're saying there. You found a way to touch his life so exactly. that he was ready to accept. Do I got to accept Jesus? Whatever I need. That's, it's making an impact on my life. We're getting ready to go to Kenny Smith. Um, but uh, let, let me come to uh, Dr. O'Sullivan real quick. Uh, can you, do you have any thoughts uh, on this, uh, talking about self-discipline that you want to kind of discuss real quick yeah sure i think of one thing I, um my dad made me a little framed photograph uh that i had on on the back of my um, bed growing up and it said every day you don't practice the next day you will settle for a lesser degree of performance wow. um, that stuck with me you know not only in regards to athletics obviously i didn't practice enough <laughs> i didn't make it anywhere past high school uh but Tying that in even to our time with the Lord. You know, mm -hmm. every day you fail to spend time with the Lord, that day and the next day, like your walk's going to suffer, right? Your time with, you, with your wife, your kids, all that's going to suffer. You know, every day I don't do what I'm supposed to do in business. I mean, so that principle can just apply, you know, across mm -hmm. a lot of different circumstances. And so in regards to self-discipline, that's something that's stuck with me for a while. You know, gosh, pastors out there watching, there's so many, there's so many messages in all of this. Uh, you know, we were talking about the athletes and we're attracted to their discipline. And, you know, like what you're saying, Dr. O'Sullivan, is we, you know, if we want to be the men of God that people look at and say, I want to be like this. I, I want to have God in, using me and impacting my life in this way. Well, we have to have some level of self-discipline mm -hmm. to study the Word and to spend time with God and have that kind of relationship so that people are attracted to it, not just a fair weather fan mm -hmm. of the gospel, <laughs> if I can use that. Right now we're going to go to Kenny Smith and he's going to be singing Our God. Yes, Lord. Open the eyes of the 
God, that's Kenny Smith. I tell you, that, uh, that music's got me ready to shout. That's uh, <laughs> really good. Uh, we're we're going to go back to Dr. Gabriel O'Sullivan. We've uh, we've got a little bit of time left in this first hour. Uh, when we go off, stay tuned because we're going to be coming right back and we're going to be continuing our conversation. Uh, Dr. O'Sullivan, uh, let's jump right into your testimony uh, about 
some, I'll let you kind of take the lead about something that you went yeah. through and how God's brought you through that. Sure, man, uh, definitely. Um, so my wife and I, uh, Ryan, we we're high school sweethearts, uh, middle school sweethearts, really, if, if you get down to it. Except for those few years she dumped me. Uh, we got that <laughs> oh, in, uh, oh, uh, thankfully in 11th grade and, and been together ever since. And uh, so we got married in 2001. Uh, had some difficulties getting, getting pregnant just with some fertility issues. And uh, then 2004, we were, we were blessed with a, a pregnancy. Um, actually went to the doctor and, and uh, found out she was pregnant with triplets. And so we wow. were, you know, just taken aback and uh, scared to death, but excited at the same time. Uh, unfortunately, she went into preterm labor uh, about 21 and a half weeks uh, in 2005. Uh, uh, had had three daughters, um, Reese, Vivian, and Sophia. Um, Reese lived a day. Uh, Vivian lived um, three weeks, and then Sophia lived three months uh, before they unfortunately all passed mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. And so that was uh, that was something that we didn't see coming, kind of like you mentioned, you know, earlier there, uh, Reverend Rice. And uh, you know, we. Quite honestly, we had this mindset that, man, if we're, you know, we're following the Lord and we're in His will, at least, you know, we thought um, that things were just going to be, you know, peaches and ice cream. And then, and they had been until that time point, man. I mean, we had just, you know, had great families and great time in high school, great time in college, um, you know, trying to, again, being dedicated to the Lord, um, had two cr uh, great careers, um, She's an accountant, I'm a, a chiropractor, and, and uh, things were just as good as they could be. And then something like that hits, and it really made us um, you know, question a lot of things about what we believe. Like, how deeply did we believe what we said we believed, you know? And so it was, it was a difficult time, but God is good. He brought us through that. He taught us so much during that time just about how... Um, he loves us no matter what the world might be telling us at the time. He mm -hmm. loves us no matter what our circumstances might be telling us at the time. You know, just because we're going through a tragedy or difficulty time in life does not mean that his favor is not with us. Mm -hmm. It just means that he's going to be allowed to show his grace and his mercy even greater. Because, my goodness, when everything's <clears throat> going, going so well for you, sometimes it might be easy to forget mm -hmm. about how good the Lord's being to you. And then you go through something that, that makes you lean on him more and you realize what a, a powerful work His Holy Spirit can do in your life. And uh, so that was a, a time that we grew closer to the Lord instead of far from Him. And that's by His grace, I think. Um, because, you know, talk to some folks, and man, they go through tragedies, and man, they, they come out of the other side of that tragedy or that difficulty, and they're, they're mad at the Lord, and they're questioning Him, and they're, why would He do this to me? Why would He do that to me? Kind of thing. And, um, by His grace, you know, we came out of it saying, well, God, you know, thank you that we're still here. We still got each other. We still had three girls. You know, some people try for years to get pregnant and they never can. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we had those, those daughters and we believe that they are in heaven and that we will see them again one day, you know, Absolutely. whole and complete. And so, you know, we have hope in that, you know, like we don't have, we don't, we don't mourn like those without hope, right? Right. Um, and so that was just, a, it, was a, it was a great time of growth for us, even as a couple. Um, you know, we, we had, we, we had a lady at the hospital and we were still there, uh, and she shared with us, she said that she had experienced a similar situation where she had lost a child and, and, uh, and unfortunately she and her husband did not make it through that, that difficult time. They ended up getting divorced just because of the stress of the situation and it just pulled them apart. And, uh, she just encouraged us. She said, don't let that happen to y'all. Stay close to one another, you know, communicate with one another. And, uh, and we, we took that to heart. And even though I didn't want to talk a lot of times, because as a man, I just want to keep it inside and just kind of do my own thing. You know, thinking back to what that, what that lady told us that day, she was a massage therapist, massaging my wife's feet after she had delivered. And, and, uh, and man, that was, she was like an angel, you know, sent to us, just God's, God's word just speaking to us. And, and so, so we did, we shared, we opened up, we grew closer together um, as a couple, and we grew closer to the Lord during that time. And, yeah, uh, and man, we got three kids now. You know, nice we got uh, so we about a year after all that, she got pregnant again. Um, healthy little baby girl who's 11 years old now, and then we have two little boys as well. Um, so we got 11 year old, a six year old, and an 18 month old. Praise God! Wow. You know, 
it's uh, it's so hard when whenever we pray. Most time, I feel like our faith is in. It's sometimes it's not in in God. It's in the yes, you know, mm-hmm. which is why I feel like we can get depressed when we get a no, or when something doesn't happen because our faith was in a certain outcome. And uh, you know, I, I try never to set myself up because you know I'm I'm just a man. And I never know what God may be thinking. I mean, even. Uh, when the Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were getting ready to be thrown into the fiery furnace, I love what they said. They said, "We, you know, we will not bow down to your image. God will deliver us from this fire." But then I love what they said. They said, "But even if He doesn't, yeah, that's right." You know, which is basically saying our faith isn't in that He's going to deliver us. We have faith that He can, but if He doesn't, He's still, still God, still and I'm still not bowing down to you. That's right. We're getting ready to go uh, off for a short break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to uh, continue uh, talking with uh, our group tonight, and I hope that you'll come back and join us for some great conversation and some great music. <laughs> 